Greetings, friends, and welcome back to Monster Monday. On today's episode, we venture once more underground to explore the ecology of the Grimlock. Hello, friends. The Grimlock has been around in lore for quite some time. Um, but we're looking at the fifth edition version. So if you're following along at home in your fifth edition monster manual, it's on page 175. Um, I, I like subterranean creatures because typically when you get these subterranean creatures, the monster manual sometimes will include some samples for where you could find these creatures and even some backstory about how they came to be. So let's take a look at that and then We'll put our own spin on it and ponder some possible encounter ideas and maybe a whole adventure that focuses around the Grimlock. The degenerate subterranean Grimlocks were once human, but their worship of the Mind Flayers over generations of prowling the Underdark transformed them into blind, monstrous cannibals long ago. The empire of the Mind Flayers once spread across many worlds, enslaving countless races. Among those were human cultures whose high priests, the Mind Flayers, subverted using their insidious powers of thought control. Those leaders gradually turned the faiths of their followers toward the Illithids, which they worshipped as blasphemous deities. Over time, the rituals of these enslaved humans created fervent cannibal cults that regarded the brain-eating of the Mind Flayers as a holy sacrament. The Illithids commanded their worshippers to abduct other sentient creatures to be sacrificed. After the victims' brains had been consumed, the Mind Flayers gave the lifeless bodies to the cultists. When the rule of the Mind Flayers crumbled, their cults faced constant warfare from their enemies, the same creatures that had once been their victims. The cults fled into the Underdark domains of their Illithid gods, over generations in that lightless realm, the cultists learned to rely on their other senses for survival. In time, their eyes withered away and eyelids sealed, leaving only covered eye sockets behind. A Grimlock's ears prick up at the faintest footfall or whisper echoing down stone passageways. It can speak in tones too low for most other humanoids to hear. The odors of sweat, flesh, and blood awaken its hunger, and it can track by such sense like a bloodhound. To enhance their senses, Grimlocks leave trails of blood, piles of dung, or the viscera of slain prey in places far from their lairs. When intruders pass through those areas, they carry the foul scents with them, warning the Grimlocks of their approach. For most creatures, blindness is an enormous hindrance. For a Grimlock, with its other heightened senses, slightless, sightlessness is a boon. A Grimlock isn't fooled by visual illusions or misperceptions. It is fearless as it stalks prey. Grimlocks still venerate the Mind Flayers, serving them whenever possible. Grimlocks also recall the war in which they were driven underground. To them, it has never ended. They continue to return to the surface world to abduct captives for their illithid masters. So that sounds pretty epic, doesn't it? And then you look at the stat block and you're like, wait, they're one quarter CR? That doesn't seem right. So here's how we can use them as intended, but also some variations. Um, armor class 11, hit points 2d8 plus 10. That explains why they're a low CR, not too easy, or not too difficult to kill. Um, they can't be blinded because they're already blind. They do have blind sight for 30 feet or 10 feet if they're deafened. Um, they speak under common, which is industry, uh, yeah. Blind senses. The Grimlock can't use its blind sight while deafened and unable to smell. Keen hearing and smell. The Grimlock has advantage on wisdom perception checks that rely on hearing or smell. Stone camouflage. The Grimlock has advantage on dexterity stealth checks made to hide in rocky terrain. Then they have attacks of a spiked bone club. Plus five to hit, 1d4 plus three damage, plus 1d4 piercing damage. I guess that's the spiked bone club. Okay, so this would not be a horrible encounter for a low-level party to deal with. Um, you could drop in as few or as many as you want. You could have the Grimlocks ambush them, 
or you could have the Grim Blocks just racing towards the party, uh, full on war mode. But a lot of different ways that you can have them encountered in caves, caverns. Uh, I could even see dungeons, maybe a dungeon that opened up into a natural cave formation where the Grimlocks can come and go. Um, if, of course, you use the, the Forgotten Realms under dark setting, these are already given to you as ways that you can use these. And they even mentioned um, going to the surface for raids. So again, how do you take this and make it more than just the encounter? Um, one way, I think, is to reference the Mind Flayer and the Illithid background. Um, so in your setting, if you so choose, you could have a cult, an active cult, um, who are trying to bring back the power of the Mind Flayers. And they are doing a series of rituals that are summoning Mind Flayers, and they're, they're preparing for those rituals. And they have an alliance with the Grimlocks, who also seek to bring back the Illithid Masters. Um, you could take the idea that's presented here with that, put that cult spin onto it, and now you have a whole adventure that could last multiple sessions where the party's trying to uncover where these human abductions have been taking place and why they stumble onto this cult. They do some research, some investigation, some history, go to a library, check out the temple, do some interviews. They keep having run-ins with either cultists or Grimlocks who have come to the surface. They finally track down where this underground cave system is. They start to go in there to rescue some of the captives. Maybe an important person or figure from the town was abducted, and now the lord or the mayor needs the party to actually you know, take action and go rescue this person before it's too late, that kind of stuff. Um, you could even kidnap a friendly NPC. Suppose that like the party has a friend who is an NPC that could be one of the captives to give the party more of an incentive to rush down into this cave system to try to rescue their friend. That could all be done at low level. Now at mid-level, how, how do you make these accessible for a mid-level adventure? Well, scalability is the key here. So you can have some regular Grimlocks, but then you could also create some Grimlock war chiefs. Okay, how do you create a Grimlock war chief? Um, you give it uh, AC of 15 instead of 11. You give them two attacks. Uh, you give them a higher strength so their attacks do more damage. And maybe the Grimlock Warchief um, has triple the number of hit points. So instead of 2d8 plus 2, they have 68 plus 10. I don't know. I just made that up. But the point is, is that if you have a mid-level party, you need to challenge them with something more than your basic Grimlock. So you create a Grimlock War Chief, and you have one or two Grimlock War Chiefs for every eight to 10 Grimlocks. Now you've just scaled up this very simple, basic one quarter CR creature and made it more challenging. Also, I think a Grimlock War Chief maybe would attack more strategically and set up ambushes. And that you can draw right back from the flavor text here. So you could have the party going into the caves and they come across dung and guts and stuff and they, they have to walk through a room of this. Now, an experienced party is going to be suspicious and they might, they might be thinking to themselves like, oh, maybe there's a, some kind of creature in here. And they carefully move through the room with the offal and the rotting flesh and the guts and the poo. And they make it through and they're like, all right, we're relieved. How many parties are actually going to wash that stuff off with water? Probably not most of them. So meanwhile, now you've set the, the scent in the air, right? So the Grimlocks know this party's coming. The war chief, being more intelligent and having more tactical knowledge, would then deploy the Grimlocks for an ambush. So that's how now you've, you've added strategy to a creature that's basically stupid. I mean, they have a nine intelligence and an eight wisdom. They're not the brightest bulbs in the bunch. But now with the, the leadership and guidance of um, the Grimlock War Chief, who, by the way, might have armor. Maybe they have armor. Um, that's how you can up this. Now, you might say, OK, Bill, we buy it. Your scalability could apply to a mid-level. But what about high level, Bill? There's no way a Grimlock would be useful in a high level adventure. Wrong. Wrong. Because just like we created the Grimlock War Chief, we have a Grimlock Magi. Now, 
how do you build a Grimlock Magi? I have no idea. Maybe this Grimlock Magi is not actually a wizard. Maybe this Grimlock Mag Magus is uh, a warlock. A Grimlock Warlock? Grim, Grim Warlock. Grim Warlock. There you go. A Grim Warlock has made a pact with an extremely powerful Mind Flayer from another dimension who has granted Warlock abilities and powers and spells. And that Grimlock Warlock, Grim Warlock, I gotta come up with a good name for that, could then be leading the War Chiefs who are in turn leading the Cannon Fodder Grimlocks. So now you have the ability to cast spells, to dispel magic, to cast other powerful uh, fireball, I don't know, you name it, or multiple Eldritch Blasts. Maybe they have some ritual power. Or let's say you don't want to go with the Warlock, you give them some sorcery abilities. Or, I hate to say this word, it starts with a P, psionics. I mean, I don't, I've never liked psionics. I thought they were too powerful. It was just OP city. But suppose for a second that you have a very powerful and smarter than normal Grimlock who has learned from the Illithid masters how to use psionic abilities. You could kit bash this all day long, but the point is, is that you have three tiers of Grimlocks, right? You got your basics, you got your war chiefs, and then you have your magic using Grimlocks. It could even be divine magic, I don't really care. But the point is, you make them more powerful, you give them more hit points, you give them some spells, maybe some damage resistance or some spell resistance to mental attacks, charm, that kind of stuff. Um, but one way or the other, you can have Grimlocks who have the ability to lead other Grimlocks who also have the ability to lead other Grimlocks. And all of a sudden, the Grimlocks as a society are actually a little more challenging. Now throw in a Mind Flayer. Maybe you actually have, for your high-level adventuring purposes, as the characters go through this and find out that it's more than just one cell of Grimlocks, that this is a whole campaign worth of stuff. There's whole cults all over the place who are trying to bring back the Mind Flayers, and they have immense powerful resources by a bunch of misguided fools who think that if they bring the Mind Flayers back, almost like a Cthulhu thing, you know, like the people who are like, we'll bring the Dark Masters back and they will reward us, even though they won't reward you, they'll just eat your brains. But they think that they'll be rewarded, right? So they, they have all these cults all over, these sleeper cells of cults, who are working with Grimlocks, and occasionally the high power people run into these Mind Flayers and other servants of the Mind Flayers. That's how we could jo just go from this Grimlock thing to some encounters, to some adventures, to a whole campaign setting by scaling up the Grimlocks, adding in different alliances with cults, and even with the master Illithids. So uh, hopefully this gave you some cool ideas for how to use these guys. Um, I always think of like, Grimlocks as like Morlocks, you know, like the underdwelling, gray-skinned, you know, mutated humanoids who, who live in the sewers. And hey, that's another location. Maybe these Grimlocks live in the sewers beneath a city. They don't even have to live in caves or the Underdark. They're just sewer dwellers. So you could put your own spin on it. Use them how you will. Hopefully this has been informative, helpful, maybe gave you some ideas. But as always, join us next time for Monster Monday. Please make sure that you like, subscribe, and hit the notifications bell so that you will be notified when our next video drops. Thanks, peace, as always, have a good time.